Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? I'll tell you why. It's a depressing world out there. You read the newspapers, you turn on the TV, you encounter death, disaster, pain, misery, despair. Whether the stories are of wars, famine, or those private, personal stories that never come to the public attention, life can be a burden. How about the challenges of raising children in this day and age? The worry of grandchildren? Illness, infirmity? It is a tough world out there. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Three times in these two Psalms, and they should be taken together really as one, because their language and themes are the same. We find the questions. It is a lament for someone who is cut off from the temple in Jerusalem, carried off to a foreign land, exiled from all he knows, from his God and in despair. The message is the same. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. O oh God, my, my, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I un go and meet with God? The psalmist's thirst for God is more than simply a desire. And just as water is a necessity of life, for the psalmist, God is his necessity in, in his life. But in that foreign land where he's been exiled to, he believes communion with God is far away because God, they believe, is in the temple in Jerusalem. But have you ever felt that way? I'm sure most of us have at sometimes in our lives when hit with grief or pain or misery or despair. We cry out, where are you, God? Our prayers seem to go into the ether and are no answer. But what makes the moment all the more painful for the psalmist is that he recalls the days when the opposite was true. And we can do the same. There were days when this church was full. He remembers a time when he was not on his own, but part of the crowd on their way to experience an intimate, God, the nearness of God intimately in the Jerusalem temple. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession through the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Now, this is not the memory of a sleepy Sunday morning appearing at church. This is an ecstatic day, like the ecstatic day that you accepted Christ as your saviour. The day your child was born or baptised. That Christmas Eve communion where you felt so close to God. That Easter morning when the truth of the resurrection became so real to you that the hope of heaven was palpable. The, the psalmist recalls times such as these when he felt as if he were beholding nothing less than the face of God. But that was his past. What about his present? Now he hears only the sound of his own pain. Why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as he hears again those relentless thoughts from his captors. Where is your God? Where's your God? Their land was full of gods, the gods of stone and gold and wood, but the living God. And then from the depths of his tortured spirit, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? And something wells up within him and he gets his answer. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, 
my Saviour and my God. And three times in the next few verses, not only is the question repeated, so is the answer. Despair and hope coexist for the psalmist. They exist for us. They existed for Jesus. We heard his prayer in the garden of the Gethsemane. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but your will. Hope gives a wonderful message. Even though the day's news may be depressing, what is important, what gets us beyond despair, is the fact that today's news is not the end of the story. It was not for Jesus. It is not for you and me. Remember the story of Jesus healing the man possessed by demons at Gerasenes and they sent him into the herd of pigs. This man is shown as being less than human, naked, living in the tombs, driven into the wilderness, shouting and screaming profanities. A commentator writes, but at the end of the story, he is transformed, wearing clothes in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus, able to go home. The story of the Gerasenes demonic should now be interpreted so that it speaks words of assurance and hope to those for whom every day is a battle against depression, fear or anxiety. Put your hope in God. Some say the greatest battle in our time is between belief and secularism. But the real battle and struggle of our time is the fundamental choice between cynicism and hope. It is ultimately a spiritual choice. Hope is not a feeling. It is a decision. And the decision for hope is based upon what you believe about the world and what the future holds, it is based upon your faith. Choose hope. Not as a naive wish. Choose with your eyes wide open to the reality of the world. And the reality of the world are these. Almost half the world, close to three billion people, live on less than two pounds a day. And more than one billion live on less than one pound a day. And every day, 13,800 children die due to utterly preventable causes such as hunger, disease, lack of safe drinking water. For the first time in history, we have the knowledge, the technology and resources to bring the worst of global poverty to an end if governments would take and have the moral and political will to do so. Why are you downcast, my soul? Why disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. The Bible is filled with hope, with such promises, God's offer of life and meaning. The New Testament is especially full, and many of them come from Jesus himself. Because I live, you will live also. I will never leave you or forsake you. Abide in me and I will abide in you. Come to me all that are weary, labor, do labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. You will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. It will come upon you. Wonderful promises, promises full of hope. Many of you will have heard of Sing Sing, the infamous prison in New York. Theologian Jim Wallace was invited by the prisoners to come and give a talk. It sounded like a good idea to him, so he wrote back asking when they wanted him to come. In the return letter, the young Sing Sing resident replied, Well, we're free most nights. We're kind of a captive audience here. So arrangements were made and Jim and 80 prisoners, for four hours, they talked and debated. And he recalled one of the young prisoners saying to him that night, Jim, 
All of us at Sing Sing are from about five neighbourhoods in New York. It's like a train. You get on the train when you're about nine or ten years old and the train ends up here in Sing Sing. We need hope. Behind the walls of the prison, many prisoners studied and the young man had chosen theology and told Jim Wallace, in prison I was so often down, but the Bible has given me hope. And when I get out, I'm going to go back and stop that train. And he did. He went into youth work and took so many young people who were caught up in the drugs and all the different things that go on. And he helped so many. When the psalmist question rose within the young man, why are you downcast, my soul? Why so disturbed within me? He had learned to put his hope in God. Because he knows there is more to the story. Sing Sing wasn't the end. Stanley Magaba was the first black person to be president bishop of the Methodist Church in Southern Africa. His story is a thrilling one. You should read it. About the time Nelson Mandela was sent to prison, Stanley met with a group of angry students who were sought to dissuade, and he sought to dissuade them from violence in this a demonstration they were doing. And he was arrested just for that, trying to stop the violence. He was imprisoned for six years on the notorious Robben Island, and it is really bad there. My brother has been there. There Stanley met and became friends with Nelson. And one day someone pushed a religious tract under his cell door. Stanley read it. And as a result, he began to read the Bible. He became a Christian. Later, Mugaba wrote in his book, Convicted by Hope, in which he told of his prison experience, Christian conversion and call to the ministry. He spent his time in prison dressed in khaki shorts, sleeping on a straw mat in a cold cell with very little food. He had nothing to read. Even the Bible that a friend had given him was taken away. But he remembered the story of the rich young, young ruler and the words Jesus said to him. Go, sell, come and follow me. Those words changed his life. He wasn't rich. In fact, he had nothing. But he was filled with hope and made a response to that call. And he quoted the words of Charles Wesley to explain his experience. You'll know it well. Thine eyes diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. Extraordinary hope was given to me, he said. I survived hunger. I survived beatings. And I decided to become a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine it? Not only converted in prison by reading the Bible, but called to preach and more, receiving the power which enabled him to survive until his release from prison and to go out into the world to become later the leader of the Methodist Church in Southern Africa. It's a great illustration of the fact that faith in God through Jesus Christ, to which the gospel calls us, and the promised benefits of redemption and new life in the spirit we are offered. We are not on our own. We're never on our own. Salvation is initiated by the Father, implemented by the Son, and applied by the Holy Spirit. In a re recent Christian journal, someone wrote... If preachers decide to preach about hope, let them preach out what they hope themselves hope for. They hope that the words of their sermons may bring some measure of understanding and wholeness to the hearts of people who hear them and to their own hearts. They hope that the public prayers they pray may be heard and answered. And same for private prayers. They hope that somewhat lethargic hymns, the less than magnificent offerings, the self-conscious exchange of the peace, 
are all somehow acceptable in the eyes of the one in whose name they are offered. They hope the sacrament of bread and wine may be more than just a routine exercise. They hope all those who come to church faithfully week after week may have their spirits fed. And the heart of all their hoping is the hope that they know God about whom we speak really exists. Well, I do hope all that. But what I draw on is more than hope. It is something I know in the very depths of my being, no matter how downcast or disturbed my soul gets, and it does, it does for all of us. I knew, know there is more to the story, and that makes all the difference. Horatio G. Spafford is a name you're probably not familiar. Mr. Spafford was a successful Chicago lawyer who lost most of, most of his wealth in the financial crisis in 1873. But he sent his wife and four daughters on a trip to France. But on the way, their ship collided with another ship and sank. Of the 225 passengers, only 87 survived. Mrs. Spafford was one of them, but the four daughters perished. As soon as she reached land, she tele telegraphed her husband, saved alone, children lost, what shall I do? Spafford immediately left for France to join his wife and bring her back to Chicago. And the depths of his bereavement, he wrote something that keeps his name alive. It is only him. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Do you ask yourself that question? Is it well with your soul? Do you thirst for God? Move beyond that despair of the world. Believe, quench your spiritual thirst. Put your hope in God. Remember what Jesus told the woman at the well? Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's what's beyond. The Holy Spirit secures the hope that one day every knee should bend and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What truth, what victory, what hope, what a sign of the kingdom. And so be it. Hallelujah. How is your soul? Is it well? <laughs>